So uh, it's my pleasure to, to welcome you here today to this talk called Finding North. Uh, my name is Alex Lada. I'm a faculty member in global studies uh, and also in geography and environmental studies, and I'm interim director of the Cold Regions Research Center. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome our guest speaker, Su Suzanne Nurberg, uh, to Laurier. And I'd like to thank the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada for welcoming us into their lovely facility here and for handling all the technology for the uh, remote uh, attendees as well. Before I introduce Susan, I'd like to do a brief uh, land acknowledgement. Um, Laurier sits on the traditional territories of the Arwandaran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples, a region which today is also home to many other First Nations, Métis, and Inuit from across Canada. Um, for any visitors outside the region, perhaps for Suzanne, in fact, I will share that Laurier sits within a 950,000 acre tract of land granted to the Haudenosaunee Confederacy in 1784. Uh, this is the Haldeman tract, but subsequently eroded to only 5% of its previous extent. Uh, and that 5% is the current day Six Nations uh, Reserve. This territory is also governed by the One Dish, One Spoon Treaty. Uh, it's a treaty between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples. And it symbolizes um, sharing the wealth of the land and caring for it in common. Acknowledging the land is an opportunity uh, to express our gratitude, not just to Indigenous peoples uh, for their careful stewardship of the land over generations, uh, but also to the land itself. This is also an opportunity to reflect on uh, collective and individual responsibilities to each other, to the land, and to mending relationships between settler society and Indigenous peoples. So Suzanne Nurberg is a freelance journalist, a writer, and an editor. She was born in Sweden and grew up there and then immigrated to Canada as a young adult. In a world where it is often complicated to say where we are from, uh, Suzanne speaks and writes of a midlife reorientation of her own compass, which has involved reconnecting with her Sami roots on the north coast of Norway. Suzanne's journalism has appeared in multiple publications, including Canadian Geographic, Broadview Magazine, National Geographic Traveler, Report on Business Magazine, Globe and Mail, and Azure Magazine. Over the past few years, she has focused her work on Northern and Indigenous themes, especially in relation to climate change, where she has been documenting efforts by Indigenous peoples and scientists to understand and come to terms with the radical changes to northern landscapes and lives as permafrost thaws and other changes um, have their effects. Currently, Suzanne is also a student again, pursuing a joint master's degree in Northern Indigenous Governance and Entrepreneurship between the University of Saskatchewan and the University of Tromso, uh, which is the Arctic University of Norway. So uh, our event today, I just want to remind everyone that we are recording. Uh, this is a hybrid event, and so welcome to our folks that are joining us online. So Susanne is going to present for about 50 minutes, uh, and then after that, there will be an opportunity for some dialogue and questions. If, if you're on Zoom, uh, feel free to type in questions along the way as they occur to you, um, or hold on to them to the end, whatever you prefer. Um, the way it'll work is uh, you can either type your questions into the uh, question uh, chat and we can read them out here, or if you'd like to raise your hand, we can enable your microphone so that you can ask your question uh, directly if you prefer that. So a couple options for you if you're online and you wanna have a question uh, for Suzanne to, to think about. We'll be closing off things about 5.30, um, but for those who are here, Suzanne can hang around a few minutes after that if you'd like to chat further. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Suzanne Nurberg. Thank you, Alex. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, okay, I think that's the wrong slide. Right. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm sort of new to this, so uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've, I've titled this, um, talk about my experiences and my observations of the North, finding North, because there are many North. And um, for those of us who live 
uh, in, in southern Canada, we don't all, always see the different north and the different realities um, in these places. Uh, shortly after I agreed to come to talk today uh, about some of the work I've done, I was struck with a bit of panic. <laughs> For one, I'm a writer, not a speaker. And what would I talk about? Unlike many of you who are doing research in Canada's upper latitudes, I'm not an expert on the north or on cold regions. I'm just a regular person. But as a regular person, I'm a citizen of a country that sees itself as northern. We Canadians tend to think of ourselves as northern, yet most of us are clustered along a line that hovers between the 40, 42nd and 49th parallels, latitudes that aren't even in the boreal region. What does this do to our perception of the North and to our understanding of Canada? The idea of North and being Northern struck me when I immigrated to Canada from Sweden. In Sweden, I lived at a latitude quite a bit farther than Toronto and Montreal, but I never thought of myself as Northern. I realized that in the greater Toronto area though, people really saw themselves as citizens of the great white North. And soon I did too. I didn't dwell on this notion, but it popped up again in a big way when the Toronto Raptors won the NBA championship in 2019. The team slogan, We the North, was plastered all over social media on placards, t-shirts, etc. By that time, I had had a few opportunities to travel to all three territories for work. And at this time, it made me wonder how Toronto could so squarely be placed in the north when it is so squarely located at latitude 43.65 degrees, a line where you'll also find Milan and Corsica. I hope any Raptors fans here will forgive me for thinking that defining North Toronto as North is both, both arrogant and ignorant. Maybe it's meant as a joke and as a rallying cry for what we are not, the United States. And sure, Toronto is located north of most of the US, but even then, it speaks of a lack of understanding of what this country is, and it makes Northerners out of people who may never have set a foot above Ontario's cottage country. It might even reinforce the image of Toronto as seeing itself as the center of the universe. I should point out that I lived in Toronto for 18 years before uh, I moved to Montreal, and I still sometimes miss the city, but I do not mistake it for what it is, what it is not, the North. Different visions of the North have been interpreted in, in art. A pianist, Glenn Gould, pondered the North in the 1967 CBC documentary, Glenn Gould, The Idea of North, in which he, to quote the CBC, explored the condition of solitude. Journalist, author, and founding member of the Rio Statics, Dave Bedini, celebrated the North, specifically the Northwest Territories, in his book, Midnight Light, a collection of stories that he dedicated to the Dena Nation. The group of seven is associated with the North, even though the members were only Northern in the same sense as the Raptors are. Still, some of the artists depicted Northern landscapes. But then there's Ted Harrison with his colorful renditions of the Yukon and First Nations artist, Roy Vickers, who commits Northern BC and other places in the province to canvas. Not to speak of the famed Inuk artist, Ashava Kanujua, and her prints from Nunavut, and the Nunavut sculpture Barnabas, whose minimalist stone carvings of man and beast are as timeless as the rock from whence his creations bring to light. I'm not an expert on the North. I've never lived there. But so much of Canada is located above the 60th parallel, which could be used as a starting point for the North, that it's impossible, even irresponsible, to ignore. And I've been lucky to travel to all three territories for work, that has allowed me to see a part of Canada most people in this country never get to see. The cost of traveling to the north can be prohibitive. A flight from Ottawa to Pond Inlet uh, to the north end of Baffin can cost $5,000. What I've learned is that the north carries many meanings. For me, as a Canadian, it's important to see these meanings to better understand my adopted country. It is also important if I, as a journalist, want to help bridge the gap that exists between the North and the South, or even between scientists and the general populations who rarely get to see the research happening in the North, 
or between researchers and indigenous peoples whose knowledge is all too often left out of the academic realm. I'll take you on a little tour of some realities that I've noticed, realities we don't always see, and realities we think we know. Do I have to hold it that way? Uh, this is Nunatriavut, and north here could mean resilience and decolonization. Um, before I decided to go freelance, I worked for eight years at Enroute, Air Canada's in-flight magazine. I was lucky in that I was the only one on staff who wanted to travel to and write about the north. With the other editors preferring warm, sunny locations, I didn't have to compete for the occasional times that I managed to convince the team that we should be bringing North to the magazine's readers, who, after all, were mostly Southerners. The North was also part of the country, and there seemed to be more happening in terms of Indigenous communities demanding and slowly gaining some level of self-rule and starting their own corporations to bring in revenue and build economic resilience. One such place was Nunatsiavut, the traditional territory of the Labrador Inuit. The Labrador, the Labrador Inuit entered the Labrador and Inuit Land Claims Agreement in 2005 after decades of political activism and legal wrangling with the provincial and federal governments. Since then, they've steadily been building their own economy thanks to the creation of the Nunatsiavut group of companies. At the same time, they've also worked on reclaiming culture, language and traditions nearly lost to colonial erasure. The most obvious sign of this revival was the commissioning of the Ilusuak Cultural Center in Nain, Labrador's northernmost permanent settlement. Taking a design cue from traditional sod houses destructed from whalebone studs covered with thick layer of turf, the, buildings, the building, the cultural center, started construction in Nain in 2016. Here was a positive development in the north and an opportunity to flip the bird to negative stereotypes. It was a good time to find out what was going on. My first stop was in Nain, where I met with Johannes Lamp. Uh, Lamp was the president of the Nunatsiavut government. He took me through the far from finished cultural center. Here it's uh, still under construction. Uh, Lamp told me about forced relocations, the banning of cultural practices and residential schools at the hands of Moravian missionaries and government, and the legacies left in their wake in the form of mental health issues and substance abuse. But Lamp also stressed the work that was underway on the community center. It's being built by Labrador Inuit for Labrador Inuit, he said with pride. At the entrance, there will be portraits of people from throughout Nunatsiavut. The first thing they'll see is a reflection of themselves, he said. To him, it was crucial to start seeing oneself again. And when so much of one's history has been deliberately erased, that was a big thing. The next stop where I stayed for nearly a week was the Torngat Mountains base camp and research station in Saglek Bay on the Labrador Sea. Uh, here, I witnessed youth engaging with visitors and working with scientists. Daryl was telling me about his dream to start a snowboarding guide business in the area. Jason was completing his BSc in environmental science and was applying to grad school so that he could come back and, as he put it, help his people. And Megan was going on a sailing voyage to Europe with indigenous youth from different parts of the world. While they displayed a sense of optimism, they also told me about friends who had committed suicide, including youth including youth leaders who, despite their fighting spirit, carried traumas passed down from previous generations. Their point was that you can't ignore or look away from the reality of colonial violence. Still, the rigor takeaway from base camp was resilient. One evening, I set out by boat with two Nunatsia Vumis. Beneath the last rays of the setting sun, John Anderson steered his zodiac along Saglet Bay in the Labrador Sea to an outcrop of smooth rocks. At a more temperate latitude, they would have been the perfect spot for sunbathing. At 58 degrees north, however, they became the ideal table 
table height filleting station. How do you say Arctic char in Inuktitut? I asked Elias Harris, who with Anderson had agreed to take me out on the fjord to check their nets. Ichaluk, said Harris, holding up the fish. Its rosy belly matched the late evening sky, its scales catching the glint of the sea and the greenish freckles on its back ripping off the pixelated Torngat mountains beyond. The two men worked like surgeons before, and before night snuffed out the remaining light, we were back at base camp bearing bags of fillets. Like fishing camps set up by the Labrador Inuit in the summer months, base camp also popped up for a few weeks in the summer. Located 200 kilometers north of Nain, it hosted nearly 400 visitors in total the summer I went, along with botanists, geologists, biologists, and other scientists who do field work here. One group of researchers was looking into whether the earth had tectonic plates 3.9 billion years ago. I had come here to learn more from Inuit elders and youth and from the majority Inuit staff of about 20 who worked as bear guards, skippers, cooks and guides and unofficially as storytellers. This was a place that let you glimpse millennia of Inuit resilience and knowledge, stuff that would be the basis for the exhibits and activities at Ilusuat in Nain. But base camp was also the access point for Tongai, also known as the mountains where the spirits live, the sweeping ochre and steel topography that makes up most of Torngat Mountains National Park. Saglek Bay was a mirror the day we set out for Rose Island. Gary Bakey, an Inuk from Nain, and the park superintendent commented that the ancestors were on our side. On the lookout for polar bears and minke whales, we puttered past icebergs and islands where magma had pushed through some of the world's oldest, oldest rock to create black stripes. I thought of something one of the other guests had said. We Kalunat from the south think of this as wilderness, but there isn't a wave that hasn't washed over human hands or a square kilometer of land that hasn't been brushed by an Inuk's foot. It made me think the reason the Labrador Sea could carry on its swell, the weight of giant icebergs, was because it was so dense with history. Rose Island has been a gathering place for some 5,000 years. As we scrambled up from the rocky shore, Bakey told us there were more burial sites here than in other places in the subarctic and Arctic. Along with those, along with two base camp elders who spent summers here as children, Bakey took us to a grave that held the remains of 113 Inuit, bones that had been stolen for research in the late 1970s and repatriated in 1995. We think our ancestors are happy to be back, Bakey said. Life at base camp, I was told, resembled the rhythm of traditional Inuit life with plans for the next day being more like optimistic outlooks. Wind, fog, and cloud cover determine whether you go out on the water or on the land or not at all. One day when we were grounded, the youth organized an abbreviated Inuit games with researchers and visitors alike duking it out in sports like the calf crushing one-legged owl hop and the strength testing shoulder to shoulder musk ox push. One elder said, this is what they did in the past when inclement weather, sorry, when inclement weather stopped them from venturing out. Likewise, when the men were hunting, the women would challenge one another to throat singing competitions to pass the time while they were waiting. Fun and games aside, we as a country have a responsibility to remember the actions of our governments with respect to indigenous peoples. Hebron was a community on the coast set up by the missionaries with the blessing of the government. There was a post office, a store, a school, and a church. Nomadic people were moved to this place and set new routes here until one day when the European markets, the Moravian exported fish and furs to collapsed and the settlement was no longer needed. People again were forcibly removed to an area to the south where they had no family or cultural ties. The existing population there saw the newcomers as a threat to the food source in the area, creating tensions between Inuit communities. What's more, the people from Nain nearly starved to death because they had no experience hunting moose 
and other animals inhabiting the forest. They were coastal people from north of the tree line. This is a practical example of the expression, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. No one asks what the Inuit wanted and still they prevail and they rebuild. It made me think of what Megan at the base camp said when I asked her what she wanted people in the South to know about or to understand about her people. We are still here, she replied. Next, we go to Equips Sound. Uh, here, my definition for North is ingenuity and indigenous knowledge. In 2018, Canadian Geographic called me up to ask if I would be interested in going to North Baffin to write about the flow edge. The crux, they said, was that there was a spot on a trip with a departure in just under two weeks. Was that a problem? No, I said, even though I hadn't had a chance to move some other commitments around and out of the way. What the magazine wanted was a sort of profile of the flow edge, or rather a character sketch of the spectacle of life that happens each spring on that fringe where the landfast ice meets the open ocean, the Sinak in the Nuktitut. In this case, the trip would take me to Tasiujak or Eclipse Sound, where a company called Arctic Kingdom took guests to a camp on the sea ice with daily excursions to the flow edge. I've never seen so many telephoto lenses in my life. The guests determined to capture photos of narwhals and hopefully polar bears. In late spring, when the sea ice melts and the sun is able to reach the water below, the light and radiant heat work like a particle accelerator. An upwelling of ocean currents stirs up a vortex of algae, phytoplankton, krill, and little jellyfish. And when you look down in the, into the water column, they seem to be dangling on the rays of light. Sam Omic, the lead guide, straightforwardly explained that these organisms, even though they're small, form the basis of life in the Arctic. Because when they appear on the scene, so do fish, seals, narwhals, countless species of birds and polar bears. The Sinak is an all-you-can-eat buffet where plankton and krill feed fish, which in turn feed seals and bears and whales, which in turn feed people. Travel to the flowage is by snowmobile and hamutik. from Miti Matalik or Pond Inlet, Pond Inlet. And if anyone is an Inuktitut speaker and I'm pronouncing this incorrectly, I apologize. Um, in the past, dog teams would pull the sleds. As we were loading our duffels onto the Kamutik, I noticed that the wood slats, wood slats were tied with rope uh, to the runners. Brian Simony, a Mitsimatalik resident, explained that the construction allows the sled to flex at it, as it moves over the uneven sea ice. With nails, the sled would be too stiff and break. This way, the slats flex like the rib cage on a walrus when it moves on land, he said. It's innovation that takes back hundreds of years. Like elsewhere in the north, climate change is altering lives and livelihoods. Sitting on his snowmobile at the Sinak, Sam told me about the lifetime it takes to know how to read the sea, how to read the sea ice and understand the conditions that enable safe travel. You learn about the ice by going out on the ice. You keep track of it from day to day, looking for cracks, how big they are, if they've widened since the last time you passed, he said. This routine is repeated over each season and from year to year. But assessing risk is difficult when the ice doesn't behave the way it used to. More freak warm weather, weather events in winter create slushy ice. Higher air temperatures produce more meltwater on top of the landfast ice, concealing cracks. At one point, we had to travel along a lead, a gap in the ice, for half an hour before the guides found a narrow enough spot to cross safely. And one night, there was a windstorm with gusts so strong they pulled two base camp yurts from their moorings and ripped a third one apart altogether. A film crew nearby lost two tents and their equipment. Those storms didn't used to happen, at least not in the spring. 
Each morning, Sam assessed the weather to determine if it was safe to travel to the flow edge. He checked the wind speed and direction. Offshore winds are preferred since they push pack, since they push pack ice out to sea, leaving the flow edge undisturbed. And cloud formations to forecast precipitation or storms. Sometimes the conditions warranted a physical inspection of the ice and Sam would disappear in his snowmobile. After one such reconnaissance run, he came back telling guests he heard creaking noises at the Sinat. The ice told me we need to wait, so we wait, he said, explaining that it could shift and leave the group stranded an hour away from camp. Over the five days on the sea ice, we made several trips to the flowage, and yes, we saw narwhals and polar bears. Through our binoculars, we even saw a bear that was feeding on a seal, and we went over for an inspection after it had finished its meal. It was a wow moment for sure. But what I took away from that trip more than the blinding beauty of the place was the precarious nature of life. Inuit ingenuity and that of their ancestors had made it possible for them to live here. But with climate change created not by them, but by people to the South, mainly through fossil fuel use in North America and Europe, their lives were being altered. Sam, who passed away a few months after I had done the reporting, had observed years of climate change firsthand. He knew what was happening even before the Polar Stern research ship was sent to float around the North Pole to gather data. Here, the concept of North meant that despite the presence of ice, it's not frozen in time. As the, ice, as the sea ice is changing, people are increasingly using apps to share information about hazards such as rapidly widening leads and weak ice. The Arctic, is a dynamic place. Does anyone have any questions so far? This is uh, Ivavik National Park in the Yukon. And my sort of definition or takeaway from this north is pristine habitat. The first time I saw permafrost was on the shore of the Beaufort Sea in the Western Arctic. I was finishing a two week rafting trip through Ivavik National Park with Parks Canada, which partners with the Outfitter Canadian River Expeditions on one of its annual summer trips to carry out field research. The company was taking guests down the first river from Margaret Lake, which is the lake you can see there, um, not far from Alaska's Brook Range and north to the coast. The Parks Canada team consisted of four staff from its Western Arctic field unit. Two of them were in Uvialuit, and I was looking forward to learning about how they viewed the north, their own backyard, and how they might convey it to the guests who came from different places in Southern Canada and the US. Mervyn Joe was there as a cultural interpreter and had extensive experience on archeological digs on Herschel Island in the Beaufort Sea. Peyton Lenny, an environmental scientist and resource management officer turned out to be an expert on birds, pointing out different species along the way and talking about the nesting sites and habits of raptors. The team also included GIS specialist Haley Conway, and outreach coordinator Maida McDonald, who was a liaison between the science team and the expedition guests and set up talks on science and history along the way. Before landing at Margaret Lake, I had no idea what to expect other than being in a place where we were unlikely to see any other human beings outside of our group of 20. Only around 100 people visit Ivavik each year. I had tried not to have any preconceived <laughs> notions of what kind of North I would find here and try to keep an open mind from the first evening. After all, that was my job as a journalist. The park's team's objective was to monitor the water quality of the firth. To their advantage, they had, a, had, had at their disposal a team of eager travelers who um, were looking forward to being citizen, sci citizen scientists. They waded into the river to take notes and collect water samples weather and water chemistry data and river dwelling invertebrates. The survey was part of a multi-year program 
to, to track the river's ecological integrity and look for changes or trends that could be cause for concern, small changes that could have bigger and broader implications. For example, if the, water, if the water's pH became more acidic, the invertebrates that thrive there could become displaced by more acid tolerant organisms that are not on the menu of Arctic grayling and Dolly Varden char. That could lead to a decline in fish, which in, which in turn would mean less food for eagles, bears, and other animals. The water survey wasn't expressly to monitor climate change, but future changes might be correlated to increased air temperature and precipitation that had been seen in the area. I realized that looking at the river on a micro level uh, offered a macro view of the ecosystem, but also of the landscape and of time. Standing in the immensity of this space-time continuum, it helped to look at the small stuff to fathom the big picture. The Firth is sometimes referred to as Canada's oldest river. Unlike other rivers in the country, it hasn't changed its course in 2.5 million years, thanks to the fact that the landscape it snakes through hasn't been glaciated in all that time. About 11,000 years ago, when the Laurentian ice sheet suffocated most of what we today call Canada, the Firth flowed freely. This corner of the Western Arctic, I learned, forms part of Beringia, an ice age, an ice age refugium where the Dal sheep might stroll by your tent at sheep plot camp are descendants of those refugium dwellers. So are the musk oxen that like to hang out in the rivers in the river delta close to the coast. Almost every day we hiked up to tours, limestone pinnacles that have endured through eons, and we walked through valleys that retain the V-shape characteristic of unglaciated terrain. The river is a gleaming thread that stitches together macro and micro views. Most of the guests had come to experience what they refer to as wilderness. And again, I was reminded of the notion of northern and remote regions being considered as terra nullius, territories not having a human presence. It's true that no one lives in Italy. There are no roads, there are no pipelines and no mines. That's what makes this an important habitat for caribou, which need large tracts of undisturbed land. It's also a quiet home for grizzlies and on the coast for polar bears. Migratory birds nest on cliffs and in the delta and char spawn here. There's lots of wildlife and not many people. But to understand this place as a terra nullius is colonial. It's to deny the presence over millennia of indigenous people who have followed the seasons of the animals and on land and on water. The word Ivavik, Mervin said, is in Nuvia Luktun and means a place to give birth. It's a reference to the park being caribou land with calving and grazing areas on the coast, where the sea breeze keeps mosquitoes and other biting insects at bay. While the Inuvialuit are coastal, they have always ventured inland for river fishing and hunting. The Gwich'in, whose traditional territory is farther inland, have followed caribou since time immemorial. When Ibavik National Park was created in 1984 as part of the Inuvialuit final agreement, it was to spare the area from industrialization and protect the porcupine caribou, North America's largest herd. I reveled in Mervyn's stories about human presence in the region. While it's merely a blip in geologic time, his ancestors have left traces dating back 9,000 years. At Iritchiak, an outcropping of stone rising above the increasingly flat landscape closer to the coast, Ancient stone tools tell the story of hunters patiently waiting for caribou. Hearing this, where it happened, made tangible the fact that this is not a no man's land. As Peyton and Mervyn shared their knowledge of the place, gained through lived experience, hunting, fishing, and gathering data, they also revealed concerns. Mervyn said that in the past few years, there had been more rain. Thanks to satellite imagery, researchers had started noting a shift in vegetation, with shrubs slowly moving north to cover ground otherwise dominated by berry bushes and lichens. They worried that the increased precipitation would alter the water chemistry in the river. And they were concerned about the never-ending threats from south of the national border to open up the neighboring Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to resource exploitation something that could interfere with the caribou on both sides of the Yukon-Alaska border. 
not to mention the polar bears that den on the North Slope. Even in a swath of land that's largely free of human intervention, there's change. Erosion along some parts of the river destroys nesting areas. Payton said that the expected increase in sheep traffic in the, in the Beaufort, once the summer sea ice is gone, could threaten beluga and bowhead whales, which are integral to Inuvialuit culture and to food security and sovereignty, especially when it comes to the beluga. After almost two weeks on the river, we made it to the coast. We set, we set up camp at Nunaluk Spit, a sliver of land that separates the brackish lagoon where the firth ends from the sea. On a walk along the spit, someone found a piece of bone the size of a kitchen knife and the shape of a sickle. Mervyn came over to take a look. It's a snow knife, he said. People would have used it to cut blocks of snow to build igloos. More evidence of human presence. Mervyn measured and photographed the piece and recorded its location using GPS before carefully packing in it, packing it up for analysis. We kept walking to where the spit rose and narrowed as if pushed upward. There, glistening in the sun, I saw ice covered by a layer of soil and plants. That's permafrost, Payton said. Living in the south, I had thought of permafrost as something hidden deep below the tundra. To see it exposed to the elements, to the sun, made me think, surely this isn't right. It looked and felt wrong. I had read Elizabeth Colbert's field notes from a catastrophe where she shows tangible and devastating impacts of climate warming on people living in permafrost regions. And I knew that permafrost thaw is a natural process. Still, seeing the permafrost laid bare at Nunaluk Spit made me think about the increasing speed of thaw and what it means for the people in the north and elsewhere on the planet. Almost half of Canada's landmass sits on permafrost. And what happens when that foundation thaws? How might it impact or redefine Canada as a country? And what happens to our maps and the borders we use to define where we belong? I left Ibavik with a new and contradictory image of the north. It was at once a place I hadn't that hadn't changed much in 2.5 million years, but that picture also showed that each year a little bit of the coast was slipping away, effectively pushing it into the Firth Delta and closer to the mountains. When I came home, I called up a few northerners and researchers. They told me the maps as we knew them were already changing. This north in uh, around Taktoyaktak area, um, I have called it climate change adaptation. Pelly Island is disappearing from the map. I've seen it with my own eyes. I was standing on the north shore of the island with a group of researchers when a chunk of cliff the size of a three-story building crashed into the Beaufort Sea. Even Dustin Whalen, the scientist with Natural Resources Canada and the research team's lead was blown away by the site. Look north from here, he said after that. The land went way out, about a kilometer 60 years ago. If erosion continues at the same cliff pace, Pelly Island will be swallowed by the ocean in another 60, leaving only a fading plume of sediment as evidence of its existence. Luckily, no one lives on Pelly except for a grizzly bear that was woken from its nap when we flew over and some sandhill cranes. The aim of the research on the island and other places in the Mackenzie Delta aimed partly to figure out the collapse, to figure out if the collapse of ice rich permafrost, like, like the cliff that just tumbled, was becoming a carbon, a carbon emitter rather than being a carbon sink. But in Taktiaktak, But in Taktoyaktak, the 900 or so residents had different, no less pressing concerns when it came to coastal erosion. They worried their homes would be washed into the sea. In fact, a couple of the houses closest to the shore had already been moved 
and the home of Sarah and Sandy Adam was about to be moved inland, away from the crumbling shore and pounding waves. Sandy showed me how one of the corner pillars that propped up the house was getting dangerously close to the edge. That edge has been reinforced with concrete blocks and large boulders over the years, but the increased wave action now that the sea ice season is shorter is even chewing away at that protection. The hamlet was trying to find durable solutions to stabilizing the shoreline, but in the long run, most of the people I spoke with said with heavy hearts that they would eventually have to move inland. The data collected by researchers would be stitched together to create a multi-layered picture of coastal erosion. I'm not a techie person, as you can see. <laughs> Good, thank you. <laughs> The data collected by the researchers um, would be stitched together to create a multi-layered picture of coastal erosion and landscape subsidence and what prompts them. With these details, they can create models that can be scaled up to predict future changes more accurately. For Sarah and Sandy, it will be too late to save their waterfront lot, but for the community of Tuck, accurate modeling Will help, to will help to create mitigation and adaptation plans and decide where not to build homes by avoiding subsiding ground and areas prone to flooding. Worried about the future, some people were getting involved. The risks facing the community prompted Obi Anikina to become a climate monitor with the Taktuyakta Community Climate Resilience Project launched by the Hamlet in late 2018 to track climate change indicators over time. I wanted to know more about climate, why it's changing, and what the outcomes are, he said, after a day of berry counting on the land. I want to be able to tell the younger generation. Youth, for their part, wanted to tell the world. For Ariel Lugt and Carmen Kutana, <laughs> it wasn't enough to watch the erosion of not only the land, but of indigenous culture. The then 17-year-olds wanted people in the South whose excessive consumption, they felt, drove the climate crisis to see the consequences. As part of TAC TV, which started as a storytelling school project, they, they and five other youth made the documentary happening to us. The film saw its worldwide premiere at the United Nations COP25 Climate Change Summit in Madrid in 2019. Adaptation also meant putting the climate crisis in people's face. The next uh, section will take us down the Dempster Highway into Mayo in the Yukon. And here, my definition for North is small signs, big changes. On the Beaufort Sea coast, I'd seen how the foundation of the Northern landscape was being ripped from underfoot. I wanted to get a sense for how that put pressure on infrastructure and therefore on people. So I hitched a ride with Chris Byrne, who has tracked ground temperatures on Gary Island in the Beaufort along the Dempster and in central Yukon for some 40 years. He was driving south on the Dempster, the mother of all northern infrastructure projects. projects. It, was it was lauded as an engineering marvel when it opened in 1979. The road to resources, as Baker called it, was also cheered by oil and gas execs eager to tap Beaufort's area, oil fields, and locals who were free to come and go from Inuvik on a whim. The 2017 Inuvik Taktuyaktak Highway is not dissimilar. Half an hour after leaving Inuvik, Chris pulled over on the gravel embankment. It was time to read the first of many thermos stores on the way to Dawson City. Permafrost was supposed to stay frozen forever, he said. It was seen by science as an equilibrium. But ground temperatures at all of his monitoring sites were creeping upward and already there is 10% less frozen ground in the Northern Hemisphere than there was in the early 20th century. At the three Dawson city sites, including two in town, the upper layers of permafrost were approaching zero degrees. I was shocked and scared. 
when he told me there had been more permafrost activity in the past 15 years than in the previous 10,000. Approaching the Northwest Territories Yukon border, we passed, this is actually um, close to there. We passed the million dollar hole, which is constantly refilled with gravel. Soon after, we saw eight side-by-side -side landslides, likely triggered by increasing summer rains. On the other side of the road was a thaw slump that was getting dangerously close to smothering the road. And that's the problem. Mud flows, sinkholes, and washouts, and ice plugs at culverts in winter, creating what Chris called potential murder scenes. They are the major reasons for highway closures that can last for days. The Dempster is a lifeline for the previously flying and only communities along the route. Cutting this ribbon means food has to be flown in to Fort McPherson, Chigichik, Inuvik, and Taktuyaktak, inflating already high food prices. What's more, highway maintenance costs related only to climate change hit 5.6 million in 2016, up from 1.4 million in 2005. Money that could have been spent on housing, job creation and training, and healthcare. Driving south over a landscape where the treeless tundra gave way to taiga gave me time to reflect on how climate change seemed to move at different time scales. The slow curve was represented by the ground temperature increases over the past five decades. The clock was ticking faster if you considered the increasing number of thaw slumps across the Arctic. Then there were the catastrophic changes happening on the coast and places like Kelly Island. Clearly, time was of the essence for the residents of Taktuyaktak and Chigichik, for the migrating caribou, and even for the highway maintenance crews heading out from Eagle Plain each time it rained. But even as we made it into central Yukon, the consequences of our rapidly warming climate were obvious. The Stewart River slithers between mountain ranges in the heart of the territory, carving valleys that have cradled the northern Tuchone since forever. It's a landscape that's dominated by alder, aspen, and birch, as well as fir and spruce, species that create an ideal habitat for moose and other animals that fed the people here. Arriving, Arriving in Mayo, Chris swapped the truck for a small boat. He went against the current passing the church steeple that served as a landmark for the village of 300 before rounding a bend that demonstrated that even here in the discontinuous permafrost zone, climate change was real. The rapidly eroding riverbanks signal that the wetter, wetter weather systems that have made an incursion farther north have left their soggy watermark here as well. Chris stopped at a sandbar and pulled the boat up on land he waded through horsetails before pushing aside a curtain of tree branches to get a good view of a thaw slump. Aerial photos, what's this one here? Aerial photos of the site showed a slump from 1949. A fresh slump had appeared in the old, inactive one. Some trees were leaning over the edge. Others were ready to follow. Below the headwall, chunks of soil with slender birch clinging to the top were slowly floating on mud toward the river like rafts carrying away the forest piece by piece. Astonishing, Byrne, Chris explained, as he stepped out onto the horseshoe-shaped horseshoe edge. The headwall had advanced about 10 meters in six weeks. Early the morning after, I tagged along with Mark O'Donoghue to a forest plot not far from the river. The dramatic changes along the Stewart felt remote. I started seeing that climate change could have different expressions. Here, it was drawn rather like a line under the trees, a path dusted with tiny paw prints and stamped with heavy hooves. A wildlife biologist with the Northern Tuchoni and the, and the Yukon government, Mark didn't map climate change in the physical landscape, but in the creatures that moved across it. On this morning, he was on the trail of deer mice, shrews and redback bulls. Look, the door is closed. It means someone's home, he said, 
approaching one of the live traps he'd set out the night before. He knelt and picked up the trap, a rectangular aluminum box set with a few pieces of peach and whole oats. When a rodent was enticed by the fruit and entered, the door closed behind it. Seeing the interior of the trap, I'd want to check in if I were a rodent too. There was the free food and privacy and lots of plush bedding. This redback bowl was a first time guest. It had not been tagged before. After checking its sex and weighing it by hanging it by the tail, Mark clipped a tag to an ear. It was checkout time. The purpose of the small mammal trapping was to create a baseline by which to evaluate future changes in animal populations and dynamics. Mark was looking at the cascade of interdependency in the animal world, the world of the hunter and the hunted, where voles and mice form one layer in the matrix of life. As this part of the central Yukon is warming, he has already observed shifts in these relationships, more so when it comes to large mammals. The moose is a cold adaptive species. It's moving farther north following the cold, he said, adding that more southerly deer and elk are taking its place. This subtle change is evidence to the hunters of the First Nation of the Nachonak Dan, whose on the land observations inform Mark's work by adding qualitative data. Yes, we see fewer moose now than 10 years ago. To Mark's more qualitative, quantitative reading of change, tracking specific numbers of a species. For the Nacho Nayak Dan, the moose is one of the cornerstones of life, much like the permafrost is the foundation for the northern landscape. Jimmy Johnny, a hunter and citizen of the First Nation and outspoken defender of the Peel Plateau, stopped one afternoon as he was driving through Mayo to chat to, chat to Chris. Despite the general outlook for moose in this area being bleaker than the sun on this day, Jimmy was optimistic for the couple of days ahead. I'm going hunting, so I'm on my way to clear out the, the truck, he said, nodding towards the flatbed filled with wood, buckets, and a tarp or two. As Jimmy drove off, Chris told me the effects of climate change on animals seep into the rivers too. Eroding riverbanks and thawing permafrost flush sediments into waterways where it can smother spawning grounds and over time, reduce the number of salmon people can land for their dinner plates. There's also concern that age old contaminants, including mercury, may be leaching into the water. The line ahead, whether in the shape of a faint forest path or a strong undercurrent is anything but certain for rodents, ungulates, and fish. Humans do well to note the turbulence on the horizon. Now we're moving into the Becho region in the Northwest Territories. And my definition for the North here is reconciliation and self-determination. Thinking about the Stewart River brings me to the South Decho region in the NWT. There, the defining line is also a river, the Decho, AKA the Big River, AKA the Mackenzie. And as in the Mayo area, the land around Hihi Kwe or Fort Simpson is also underlain by discontinuous permafrost. The Decho Dene and others in the region have reported more ground subsidence, thaw slams, landslides, eroding riverbanks, and more intense forest fires, even late in the fire season. In fact, a forest fire destroyed the Scotty Creek Research Station this past fall. The Dene were just about to take control of the station. I'm not going to go into that because I haven't been to the area in the immediate lead up to the takeover or since the fire. But I can tell you a little bit about some of the developments I've seen on my two visits there, first in February 2020 and in June 2022, and show how those developments show how the idea of North can be related to reconciliation. The first time I went to Scotty Creek was in the winter, just before the pandemic shut down the world, including field research and reporting. It was the annual science camp for high school kids. They had come to learn from Bill Quinton, the stations and the youth programs founder, 
about permafrost and what happens to the land when the permafrost thaws. There were only two students that year, Elizabeth and Naka, whereas in some earlier years, there had been more than a dozen participants. Watching Elizabeth and Naka learning about the physics of water and snow and how to do sampling and run analyses of those, I also learned about the importance of trees and snow to the permafrost in this region. In Tuck, you did not want forests on the tundra because it would trap snow and insulate the ground from the Arctic winds, potentially increasing the ground temperature and compromising the frozen ground. At Scotty, I was relearning what I thought I knew about permafrost. Again, I was finding a new north. I remember Bill describing the effect of permafrost thaw as similar to removing a dam. When it's gone, water can flow into streams and rivers and start seeping into and saturate the lower lying landscapes. I also, I also vaguely remember SWE, S-W-E, snow water equivalent, and going out with Naka and Elizabeth to gather the most densely packed snow possible to melt for drinking and cooking. We calculated the height of trees. Well, the students did, I'm not very good in math. And we sampled tree rings, all to gather data on the health and growth rate of the trees that protect the permafrost. Scotty Creek was also a place for sharing and exchanging knowledge among and between researchers and indigenous knowledge holders. And it had a place in the Decho Collaborative on Permafrost or DCOP, a formal collaboration between academia and the First Nations in the area, between natural and social scientists and Dene knowledge holders, guardians and government. DCOP has supported the indigenous guardians program with technical training for locals to more effectively track and record changes. To say that these undertakings are important would be an understatement because the Decho region is one of the fastest warming on the planet with implications for water, for animals, for people, for traditions and culture. The second time I had a chance to visit Scotty Creek and Tisli Kwe was this past June. Community members from across the Decho region arrived to further their skills with technology such as drones and to deepen their understanding of climate change. The focus on traditions and culture and even language as it relates to the land were more evident than on my first visit. This to me looked like a slightly different, even upgraded meaning of North. This idea of North factored in a holistic approach to the land and the study thereof. Gladys Norwegian, the former chief, held a language class to stress how words relate to the land. She stressed Dene laws, justice and spirituality and urged participants to pay attention to the relationship, not only with one another, but also with oneself. Ramona Pearson spoke about the importance of guardians, not only gathering data for outside researchers, but also eventually producing their own data to directly answer research questions that respond to the needs of communities and their members. If we as a country are really serious about reconciliation, and moving toward a near future where indigenous communities have agency and self-determination. The developments with DCOP and the Decho First Nation provide a positive example, a strong statement of how to go from words to concrete action. So in conclusion, Toronto is not North <laughs> and the North and the people who live there are not and the, north, the people who live in the real north are not a monolith. The north, at least the norths that I've had a chance to visit are places of staggering beauty of open vistas and quiet forests. But what is the land without people? What is the territory without the knowledge and stories and songs that animate it? Seeing the north is ultimately about seeing its people. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, really, really fascinating vignettes there of your what you've learned on your various uh, assignments to the north and your, uh, your journalism work up there. And so thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so we have some time now for some questions. 
And uh, I do have uh, a couple of questions here already um, in the Q&A from mm -hmm. online. So um, maybe I'll, I'll do those first. And then um, if there are other questions in the room, we'll come to those. Uh, so uh, first question, actually, I'm not sure what the order is here. I'll just start at the top. Um, Carla Johnston says, thank you for a really great talk. I'm curious how you think these Northern experiences will influence your master's studies. Good question. I think my trips North have um, spurred me to pursue these studies because I want to deepen my understanding and my knowledge so that I can be a more effective community indicator about issues that are affecting people in the north um, with climate change and potential expansion of resource extraction and what that means for the communities that live there good or bad so they I, I think it's maybe a, uh, I was thinking that it's a kind of a chicken and egg question but maybe it's not <laughs> um, it's I think they feed off each other at this point and I'm hoping that that my uh, my studies would also give me an opportunity to pursue more stories and make more connections on a on a on a deeper level. Can I just ask what is what is your program again? I know you yeah, it's it's a bit of a mouthful. It's called governance and entrepreneurship in northern and indigenous areas. And maybe I mean just to, to sort of add to the to your answer to, to Carla's question there, I wonder um, if you just want to share briefly what your proposed um, research is going to be for your for your program. Yeah, so I will be, uh, hopefully, the, the plan is that I will be looking at uh, a fjord in northern Norway um, that has long been the site of uh, reindeer, Sami reindeer herders, um, using it as calving and gra grazing areas uh, in the summer. It's also, because it's a fjord, it's also where the coastal Sami have lived for centuries and fished. And there is a proposal to uh, open up a mine, a copper mine. Um, and the tailings from that mine uh, are, uh, will be dumped in the ocean. So what I want to look at is uh, indigenous knowledge, was indigenous knowledge of the marine environment factored in when they did an impact assessment? Um, to my knowledge, may, they spoke to maybe one or two coastal Sami. They've looked more at what happens on the land and the effect on reindeer, but not on the effect of the fjord and the fish. Uh, it's, it's an important uh, area for cod to spawn. It's also the fjord um, that one of the, Norway has these rivers they call national salmon rivers. And the river that flows into that fjord, I think it's my hair. The, the, um, the river that flows into that fjord um, is, uh, is a salmon river. So the implications of dumping could be enormous, enormously negative. I'd say for for the environment and for the people who who live there and depend on these areas. Thank you. Okay, so um, next we have a question from Elise Brown Dussault, and Elise says, "Hi, hi, Suzanne. Thanks for this beautiful talk. One takeaway from this presentation is that understanding a place requires some familiarity, intimacy, respect, and time." Yet most of our mainstream knowledge production still comes from Southern institutions. What advice would you give to research institutions conducting research in the North to develop intimacy between researchers and place? I think it's really important to build in time um, to be able to develop those relationships. If if uh, researchers are so busy conducting their field work that they don't have time to speak to the people who live there and what their concerns are, then it will be really, really hard to, uh, to achieve a meaningful engagement with communities. And of course, there are always constraints. Like, do you extend 
a degree to be able to factor in that, that makes it more expensive for students. Uh, but I think there needs to be some, maybe there, maybe it's less coursework and more community engagement, depending on the type of program and, and uh, the courses you're taking. Okay, thank you. And, and so the final online that we've got so far in the Q&A, and just a reminder also, if you're uh, one of our online attendees that you can also raise your hand if you wanted to voice a question. Uh, but just before we go to the room here to see if there's questions here, one final, and it's not a question, it's a comment from Adrian Reynolds. He says, this is not a question, but as a SAMI student at Laurier, I want to thank you for the presentation and representation of our people and culture. Well, thank you. So um, turning to the room, are there any questions in, in the room for Suzanne? Caitlin. Yeah, go ahead, Caitlin. Um, I find it interesting how you like drew a divide between Toronto not being in the North. And it just kind of made me think of conservation in a sense that we often, need to visit a place and know a place and be a part of a place to feel connected to it and to feel like it's important to conserve in terms of an environmental standpoint. And I just kind of thought a little bit about how like, if we draw this divide, which I don't disagree with you by any means, like I'm wondering if that like can impact like encouraging people to take interest in climate change and try to take action. You know what I mean? Uh, no, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't, don't know really what you know mean. How to, I'm having a hard time <laughs> communicating this, but it's like, if we draw this divide and say that Toronto is not in the North, right? do we take away some of that, like feeling a part of something and make some of the importance? Right, yeah, okay, I see what you mean. I don't disagree what you're, with what you're saying at all. I'm just wondering on your standpoint on how do we encourage people that aren't there, don't have the resources to go there. Yeah, I to, mean, it's so expensive. Yeah, yeah. To, to care and to want to be take action. To... Yeah, that's a good point. I think, um, I think that becomes more of a question of how do we define ourselves as a country and, and talking about uh Toronto like not being north but being part of something that includes the north and maybe that's what it is that we're all citizens of this country and even if we don't live in the north I mean I live in Montreal it's not it's like two degrees farther north than Toronto so nothing um so I think that it's a good conversation to have I see your point because we don't want to create a divide and alienate people and say, well, you're not Northern, so you can't. Yeah. I think it's that there's like a distinction. Canada is a, North, uh, is a Northern country because we have so much of our land mass is based in the North. So in that sense, we're Northern and therefore it's of interest to all of us to care about the North. And maybe in that sense, we are Northern. But I think, I think that to some people in the North, this hashtag we the north might even be a little bit offensive mm -hmm. because it kind of ignores the, the the realities of what the north really is. I mean, there still is a high level of poverty and unemployment, um, lack of uh, good education that still needs to be dealt with. Yeah, I would agree, and I also just wanted to comment that it's like hearing your stories and how you gave this talk it was just like really engaging and really beautiful. And I think that's like a key way is like through the storytelling to get people to feel a part of something. And one of the challenges as a journalist is that a lot of uh, media outlets, they just, they don't want to spend money or they don't have money to spend. And it's expensive to do Northern stories. And sometimes I've managed to get there using my air miles and then like eating lentils because I feel that it's necessary to be there because you can't, you can't do a story. You can't 
to capture that place with doing it a, a Zoom call. You can fill in details after you've been there and say, hey, I just want to clarify something, but we need to be there. And maybe it's also that media outlets or the owners of them, they don't value stories. So that's again where the we the North is like those people don't see themselves as North beyond that, that slogan. slogan. Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So there's like even just naturally. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, the Eastern Arctic especially is, the Western Arctic is not as, it's, like, it's, it's a little more reasonable. You can call it that. <laughs> you, you were also commenting to me the other day that, um, you know, you've got this story you've been working on about Scotty Creek, but it's about permafrost. And you're saying, uh, I asked, oh, wouldn't, wouldn't Canadian Geographic be interested in that story? And you said, oh, well, they published a story on permafrost, you know, sometime in the last two years, and that's enough for them for now. So yeah. <laughs> saturation. Yeah, that, that, that also happens. And sometimes... Uh, especially with a publication like Canadian Geographic that only publishes six issues per year. So they're limited. So at this point now, they've already assigned the full year and maybe into next year. So they have no budgets left because they've already spent the budget for like a year and a half going forward. <laughs> so that's another, that's another challenge, yeah. So a question in the room and then uh, we have a few more online to come back to as well. Thank you so much. I just loved your talk and it was just so evocative. Um, I, I'm going to tell a little story that actually relates to what um, you were saying about how do you engage people. So many moons ago, um, my MA thesis uh, was uh, included fieldwork in Pond Inlet and Arctic Bay and um, had a absolutely wonderful experience um, in all possible ways. And then my life went, you know, in other directions and I never got back to them. And in some weird kind of algorithm on Facebook, um, somehow I got matched with um, a Facebook community. Like this is, it's actually quite scary, but I got <laughs> <laughs> like, how do they know this? Um, a, a Facebook community of people taking pictures in Pond Inlet. So it's locals who take photographs in Pond Inlet and they post them. Um, and people comment on them and then they start sidebar conversations. And I have so enjoyed this and it's brought back a whole bunch of different things. And some of the uh, memories for me, but also thinking about, you know, my own kind of relationship to the North mm -hmm. all these years later. And you know, how could I get back to some of that? Um, one of these sidebar conversations is somebody in Pond, Lit, Pond Inlet who takes photographs. And one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, how do I bring that into my classroom? And so introduce this person to my students to make this real and to give them some familiarity, some intimacy with the North. So I've been thinking about how to do this, but it's social media who is taking a Southerner who has not been up North for, you know, 25 years, who's now, you know, wow, you know, how, how can I get back to that? How can I bring that into my class? Because I'm also a climate change researcher. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and to make that very real to them. Um, and you know, I wonder about the power of social media to, you know, of all the things that, you know, all the downsides it, it has, one of the upsides is to create these virtual networks where I am in conversation with somebody from Pond Inlet who likes to take pictures and wants to talk about the North, right? Yeah. So maybe I just thought I would share that. And yeah, you know, no, I think that's really, um, that's really good. Uh, maybe, maybe it could be like, um, the person could join a class through Zoom and yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that to get that sense from people directly, even if you can't go there 
but it's better to be able to talk to someone over Zoom. Maybe they can even point their camera to what they're seeing outside their window. Uh, and then you get, at least you get a little bit of a sense for, for how they talk, how they, you know, think. And what they're, yeah. And it really helps, I think, to, for us to be able to care if we can actually connect what's happening to people. It's so easy to just, if you're leading, reading a climate, something about climate change and just numbers, it's so easy to just, oh, I've heard it so many times. So what I'm trying to do is make it very evocative. I, I want people to feel something because if we don't react, what's the point? We need people to react and say, oh, we, need, we really need to do something about this. So we have another on, a question from one of our online attendees. It's an anonymous question. Um, and it's sort of just asking, like you, you highlighted a number of different you know, instances of impacts of climate change and stuff like that. Um, and so the question is, uh, what are governments doing in those processes? You, do, you described some of the sort of resilience that you see in local peoples mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Do you see governments um, supporting those kinds of uh, that kind of adaptation work, the kind of uh, monitoring work, do, are there are governments stepping up to the plate to I mean, do? There, there are, I don't know the specifics of particular programs, but in in Taktuyak uh, gets money from the NWT government to be able to do some of that monitoring that they do with the community, for instance. And um, I think it's this, there's some money funding coming in from from different government agencies, but I don't feel comfortable really answering that because I'm not I'm not sure. I guess I'll find out and come back and tell you. <laughs> that will be another my next story. What okay. what are governments doing? <laughs> <laughs> so another question here, which kind of goes back a bit to our our discussion about um, kind of perception of the north and and caring about the north. So another anonymous attendee writes, there is a clear discrepancy between what popular culture pushes into the mainstream about what the North is versus the experiences and realities of those residing there, especially indigenous communities, as you described. What are your thoughts on the influence that your work, the stories you tell, et cetera, could have on this view? And could we as a society find ourselves bearing some responsibility in this aspect? Uh, in the long run. So I guess responsibility in terms of um, the views that we have and, and whatnot. I think that I have a huge responsibility in um, shaping. I don't like to think of me as someone who shapes views because I want to leave it up to people to make their decisions based on the facts that I'm presenting with a sort of an emotional angle on it. But I think it's very important for me, that's why it's important for me to try and make sure that I speak to as many people as I can who are from a place to get their view and not some, someone from the South's view of that place. That might be valid if there's a discussion about how do we see the North. Mm -hmm. um, why do we see them a certain way? Then if there's a validity to that. But I think if we want to capture the North um, and be fair to the people living there, it's by listening to them and conveying that rather than sort of deciding what. I mean, everyone filters the information gathered, whether you're a researcher, Maybe, re maybe uh, quantitative research is a little more strict, but I talk to people and if I have a certain view, I might interpret it a certain way. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very important to be careful with how we see these things and, and look at ourselves and, and place ourselves in a situation, situate ourselves from the position we're in, are we in a position of power? Are we an ally? How do we situate ourselves? I think that's really important. 
And as a reader, it's the responsibility, I guess, is to find different types of sources, not just relying on one media, one type of media, one outlet uh, that gives you maybe a very narrow view. You've, in, in some of your writing, you've talked about your role as one of amplifying voices. This seems to be sort of what you're suggesting in yeah. terms of, yeah, not wanting, yeah. yeah. Um, we have about five minutes left. Another, any other questions from the room? Or? Yeah, that's a really visually stunning uh, talk. So um, evocative is really the right word. Really, really good. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm wondering, if you could comment on the challenges of us in the South being there in the North, it seems to me it's a bit of a, probably a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you know, for all the reasons we've talked about, it's important for Southerners to experience or have a sense of, of the North and to yeah. certainly have an awareness of the ecological and environmental implications of what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think if we all sort of flooding up into Northern communities, you know, to experience it firsthand, that would also bring a whole other set of challenges to communities and infrastructure. And um, and yet, on the other hand, there I don't, there are many hands. I'm running out of hands, but there 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 are also the implications of for those communities. I'm sure a lot of economic benefit from yeah. tourism. And so, I'm just wondering, you know, how the right balance gets struck in terms of providing opportunities for people in the South to be in the North and for Northern communities to benefit economically from that uh, and at the same time not contribute to the same sort of environmental challenges that, you know, how do you not, not make those environmental consequences even worse by us all flying up to the North or, you know, yeah. ho however we do it. So we, we bring people to the university through Zoom or, or uh, you know, what, what ways do we yeah, strike the right balance, I guess, is what I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a difficult question uh, or a difficult situation because I, if I want to write about the North, uh, be, I mean, I have to fly there. There's no other way. Flying there is going to, is part of the whole um, feedback loop. Um, but I'll, I can maybe tell you something that happened to me and how it changed how I viewed the North by being there. So I think, so um, my partner and I went to, uh, to drive the Dempster Highway in 2011. And we flew from Inuvik to Taktuyakta because we wanted to see the Delta and we wanted to see Tak. And we went with a guide who took us to see the ice house uh, that's within the permafrost and thawed houses and different uh, different things. And he took us to his home and he offered us um, maktak from Beluga and also, um, I don't remember the name of it in Inuvia in Luktun, but it's like a dried, dried Beluga meat. And that was that trip. I, up to then, I had been like, I'm anti-fur, I'm anti-hunting, we got to be green, like we can't destroy, we have to be as gentle as we can. But when I met him, I, I, I realized that who am I to tell him how he should live his life? And it really changed my perception of the North. And I, I don't know if it doesn't directly answer your question, but I think it illustrates the importance still of being there. But as someone who engages, and yes, I realize that a lot of people there are probably fed up and just don't. Want, and when I was in Tuck after they the, the summer they opened the uh, summer after they opened their highway, I I, I drove the highway. And I met uh, some people in Tuck who are permanent. They, they live there. They're from there. They've always, their families have always been there. And they were saying, yeah, it's really, it's a drag with the road. It's nice to be able to leave, but it's also a drag because there are always people. 
people around, but they're walking around and they're staring at us. And so it's, uh, I think we have to have a lot of humility when we go there and not push. I think that's a tendency is for people to push their way in. And instead, it's like to gain the love of the cat, you have to just wait and then the cat will come to you. Maybe it's like that too. You have to just, if people want to talk to you, they will come up. A lot of people are very curious. Well, and I suppose, I mean, what Kevin's question and a bit what your answer points to is, is that, you know, not everyone can have that experience, uh, that sort of more yeah. intimate experience. Yeah. But maybe that then goes back to the previous question, you know, was, you know, the influences of your stories, right? So if, if, if people maybe don't need to experience, you know, everything, everywhere, all the time, uh, in order to be connected to things, but if they can hear other people's really authentic human experiences, their stories about those places, maybe those things can, yeah. can connect us. Yeah. I think social media um, can also have a negative impact because people go and they go, and they take all these pictures and post them and there's no engagement with the people, with traditions, with the land. Um, not saying everyone is like that, but I think that has had an influence on maybe um, how we engage or whether we engage. I think it's, it comes down to listening, to always listen yeah. and like really hear, like not just, yeah, yeah, whatever, I hear you. <laughs> and then walk on well that's probably a good good point to end on then the listening is is uh as a moral of the story a, a moral of the big story so yeah so thank you very much again suzanne for your talk today and, thanks and for, real pleasure to have you thanks for, for coming thanks for coming to listen and thanks for logging on online yeah thanks to all our attendees uh, online and otherwise and uh yeah, thanks again to the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada for hosting us. So, good night, everyone.